He is doing it! What a crazy idea. I've never made a ranking video with so many albums. It's a little bit over the top, to be, the, to be honest. Besides, what happens if it takes like three or four hours? With my level of blathering and rambling, this is in the realms of possibility what happens then. <sighs> no one will watch it. Chris, it's all up to you now. <laughs> you have to watch it. Uh, not even Steve Carson will watch it. No one will watch it, man. But uh, I have to do it anyway. So, um, first of all, and uh, let me say this uh, with... Uh, emphasis first of all this is not about what's best or what people like the most or what they should like the most that would be a debate for another day this ranking is only about one perspective it's about the level of impact those albums had on me so it's not even about my rational assessment of the cultural value of some of these records it is only about the role this music played in my life so there is really no reason to get upset if this list doesn't align with your list how could it align we have led different lives you and i so let's not get too pumped up over the results and i will gladly remind you of that once this list has been presented you know in case of gasping or heartburn so there are three rules in this ranking rule number one studio work only no live albums rule number two no compilations with the exception of two records you'll see rule number three is all ian anderson solo albums count why because i've always felt that uh, the border between jeff rotel albums and ian anderson solo albums is kind of washy and often doesn't make that much sense and this makes a total of 29 records. I wish it would have been 30, nice round number, but uh, I only identified 29 records fitting these rules. So let's not waste any time. This is going to be a marathon. This is all a little bit insane right now. So uh, let's begin. Number 29 is the album Catfish Rising from the year 1991. This is still a record with uh, Dave Pack and Dwayne Perry. Andy Giddings, the future keyboarder of Jethro Tull, appears only on three tracks, so it's more like a hard rock four-piece band at this point with a bunch of session keyboarders. Lancelot is outstanding on this record. Now one could mock Anderson for trying to be so deep in the mainstream, um, but to some extent it has worked. I mean, they had all these TV appearances in those days. The album is a return to some kind of a TV-friendly blues rock and has this back-to-the-roots thing going on, which was not untypical for certain bands and artists in the 90s. Robert Plant and Jimmy Page were kind of doing the same thing. To name any highlights from this album is a little bit tough because I don't like this blues rock vibe at all, but there are some tracks here that are worth your time. Check out a song called Sparrow on the Schoolyard Wall and there's a decent rock song called Doctor to My Disease. Although I guess the best song on this album is probably called White Innocence, which certainly has strong moments and some very good flute playing. Yeah, number 28, Divinity's uh, 12 Dances with God from 1995. This is an instrumental, pure flute record, a bit of a concept album dealing with the ideas of faith and mythology. It's very cinematic, it has a lot of Middle Eastern influences, but also a certain Balkanic East European vibe. This is probably the first time when Anderson recorded studio material with the new flute fingering uh, that he learned from his daughter, as far as the Jethro Tull lore goes. Um, the album has a very 90s keyboard sound, some parts are a little bit corny. Again, Andrew Giddings on keys is helping here out, Dwayne Perry on percussions. There are some really good songs here. My highlight would be a track called In Sight of the Minaret and another track called In Pay of Spain. Number 27, 
1989's Rock Island. This is kind of a album between ZZ Top and Dire Straits, but I like it much better than Catfish, honestly, because it has a more proggy feel to it in some parts. It's a bit of a transitional album, though, um, as far as keyboards go, because Vatessi was heading out of the band at this point, and the bowler hat wearing Martin Alcock was halfway in. So it's a very heavy riff, guitar-oriented album with Anderson playing a lot of the keyboard parts himself, probably. The opener, Kissing Willy, has been criticized for being distasteful. Well, it's a decent track in my book. Rock Island is the type of album that I actually should dislike more, but I kind of like this one, at least from time to time. While the songs are indeed mostly mainstreamy, uh, hard rock, blues rock tunes, there are all kind of charming, uh, whimsical details in the production, which I appreciate. Um, highlights. So there are certain few wonderful tracks that I can recommend. One of them is The Whaler's Deuce and the eponym Rock Island. Both songs still echo a little bit the former epicness of Jethro Tull, but I think the most interesting track here is the final track called Strange Avenues that shows some impressive guitar playing and some exciting flute solos. 26 1968's debut album This Was. So while I am certainly fascinated by the historical aspects of Jethro Tull's very first month and years of existence, it is true that I'm not too keen on blues rock in general, hence I'm not a big fan of their first album with Mick Abrahams on lead guitar. This debut came out in the UK in the autumn of 1968. I have not much critical to say about it. The reason why it ranks so low has nothing to do with the intrinsic quality of the album, just with my personal taste towards the blues format. I just don't like the whole 12 bar format thing. There are some tracks here even trying to emulate the conventional American blues to some degree. I get bored with uh, stuff like that after 12 to 15 seconds. Now that being said, this album is not as stylistically constricted as I make it sound right now. There are some really fascinating tunes and grooves here. Check out the moody Beggar's Farm. That's a great blues track, captivating even me. And it's followed by the quirky Move On Alone, so even though this music is basically a blues rock album, there is still a lot going on here around the edges. A lot of unconventional ideas and experimental sounds already pushing the boundaries. The very jazzy serenade to a cuckoo, testing out Anderson's new discovered flute playing style on a Roland Kirk composition, that's some great stuff. Or the feverish Dharma for one is certainly another highlight here, showing some wild stuff by Clive Bunker on drums. So this is by no means a bad album. 25. 1987's Crest of a Knave. Yeah, there is a lot of story behind this album and some people will probably begrudge me for ranking it so low. Um, but please keep in mind that I regard all Tao albums interesting for all kind of reasons and I do return to all of them from time to time. Now this one was commercially actually quite successful. This is the album that gave Tal a Grammy and pissed off Metallica, which is a good thing I guess, which probably tells you more about the nature of these award shit shows than about the music in question. This album came out after a three years break following Ian Anderson's severe vocal cord damage. So it's the first record with his somewhat new and significantly weaker voice. Crest of a Knave marks a shift to a mainstream bluesy hard rock sound with a lot of intriguing pop aesthetic that lasted for basically three albums. It has been criticized for being a weird hybrid of the ZZ Top sound combined with a kind of a Dire Straits sound in the Karma tracks. Well, there is something to it. It certainly can't be entirely dismissed, particularly if you realize how incredibly big ZZ Top and Dire Straits were in 1987. So this was not very subtle. The previous album, Under Wraps, had been scathed and verbally abused by almost everyone for using a drum machine. Ironically, this album never got that much shit, despite having still a lot of drum machine tracks on it. But generally speaking, it is the arrival of Dwayne Perry on drums, 
so I certainly don't dislike the album. And if I would be making a Tal playlist for someone, I certainly might dip into this album and pick a track there. It's an outstanding production, still having some serious proggy moments, particularly a track like Farm on the Freeway, which is certainly one of the highlights on this album. Also the quite incredible jump start. I quite like uh, Said She Was a Dancer and Budapest, great example of Anderson's observational lyrics reflecting upon touring East Europe for the first time. So look, this album ranks so low here because of all the incredible stuff to come. I don't dislike it, but it is certainly my least favorite Jethro Tull album of the 80s. But it, it has a great iconic cover designed by Andrew Stewart Jameson. Number 24, the Christmas album from 2003. Some people think that this is a hodgepodge compilation eating the humble pie of the lavish Christmas audience. You could not be more wrong. Yes, a large portion of these tracks had been previously released in one way or another, but most of the material went through interesting and intense rearrangement and for this purpose here was recorded completely anew. So the album appears very cohesive actually and stylistically very round. It's not a sketchy leftover record. Also there are four tracks that are completely new compositions and there are also four arrangements of traditional tunes. So it's quite possible that you are missing out on some good stuff. The lineup here includes Jonathan Noyce on bass guitar and Andrew Giddings on keyboards and accordion and Dwayne Perry on drums and percussions. There are some guest appearances by David Pegg, a former long-term alumni of the band. Some of the tracks are also recorded with a string quartet. One should be tempted to call the Christmas album a rather corny enterprise, but we should not underestimate Ian Anderson's somewhat subversive humor that is certainly present here. But overall, I may not be a fan of Christmas albums in general, but if you are, this is really a serious record to look into. I have never seen this album included in any Jethro Tull rankings, probably because most people think it's just a compilation and dismiss it before even giving it a listen. But it's quite intriguing and yet at the same time accordingly pleasant and actually quite vibrant. Check out the charming First Snow in Brooklyn or the intriguing Winter Snowscape actually written by Martin Barr. Number 23. Too old to rock and roll, too young to die from 1976. So this album doesn't get that much love and in many reviews it seems to be rather unpopular and certainly the least appreciated from the 70s. It is an interesting concept album about things coming in and out of fashion all the time. And yes, one could make the argument that it is a bit of an unimportant topic. Although one could also make the argument that the Austin Powers comedies are based on the same premise. Anyway, there is a lot to like about this album. Just listen to this wonderful progression in From a Dead Beat to an Old Greaser. This album marks the appearance of John Glasscock on bass, one of my favorite bass players. And certainly the bass within Jethro Tull has stepped up massively at that moment. I don't think this is a bad album, on the contrary. It just doesn't grow on me and many other people as much as other Tal albums. Again, I'm not slugging it off. It actually has a strong emotional core. And certain sense of sadness surrounding the feeling of growing older while the world around you changes. So it is actually a very poetic album and harmonically quite sentimental. So I can imagine there are people out there that regard this as their favorite record. Bless them. But on the other hand, it lacks a bit the big punches you kind of expect from Jethro Tull, or at least expected in the 70s. It's not a particular wow album, but a great record for a Sunday afternoon while you have friends over or something. So let's not dismiss it. My favorite track is probably Crazed Institution, although it takes some time until the song really gains energy. Number 22. Ian Anderson's solo album The Secret Language of Birds from 2000. This album somewhat marks a new stylistic chapter in Anderson's or Tal's history. The slightly whimsical yet elegant folk rock with the occasional prog rock excursion. 
There are no more efforts here to sound radio-friendly. All these battles seem to be fought and done. Now it's only about the idea, the composition, the tune. This new approach to style and production certainly gets even better on a rupees dance two years later. The Secret Language of Birds has some really good songs. Ian was on a roll as a composer and I think he made a good use of his ever-declining voice. There is a feeling of intensity and urgency in the songs. Again, some great observational poetry. Check out a track like Set Aside with its evocative lyrics. I mean, even many Jethro Tull fans don't know anything about this stuff, but there are some interesting moments to discover here. The album was recorded with a rather Jethro Tullish lineup with Martin Barr on guitar, Andrew Giddings on keys, and the great Gary Conway on drums. Highlights. Certainly the title track, The Secret Language of Birds, but there is quite more. Just check out the mysterious A Better Moon. That is a wonderful song with a great cinematic atmosphere evoking exotic impressions. Or listen to the dramatic The Jasmine Corridor. So this album has a lot to offer and should not be dismissed. Number 21, Thick as a Brick, part 2, from the year 2012. Creating a part 2 to the epic and cultishly followed Thick as a Brick is a bit cheeky. But Anderson plays here wonderfully into the zeitgeist of sequels and reboots and continued TV shows, something he knows all about since his daughter is married to the Walking Dead leading star Andrew Lincoln. So this is basically the return of Little Milton, better known as Gerald Bostock, and I think the experiment has succeeded. It is a very different music than the 1972's Thick as a Brick, and stylistically it is more in the region of Rupees Dance and the Secret Language of Birds. And it makes sense since Anderson's battered voice lends itself better to a somewhat more chamber-like style of music. But there is some really great rock material here like Banker Bats, which is one of my favorite tracks on this record. The lineup here includes Florian Opale on electric guitar and the reliable John O'Hara on keys and accordion, David Goodyear on bass and Scott Hammond on drums. Now the really interesting addition is the role of Ryan O'Donnell. In regard of Ian Anderson's vocal shortcomings of the last decades, this is an intriguing idea that I have immediately liked. Ryan O'Donnell is basically the second singer, not frontlining all the time, but more stepping in for certain verses and choruses. I can imagine hardcore Tull fans are totally against it, but I think it works wonderfully. He has a great, unconsumed voice that is very complementary to Anderson's own voice. They also applied this method live and I think it works great. I actually wish they would have done more with Ryan O'Donnell and given him even more to sing. Also, this album is actually an Ian Anderson solo album, but still with Jethro Tull written on the cover one more time. But obviously, this is the lid on Tull, and I don't think there ever will be another studio material under the Jethro Tull moniker. Let's remember that Anderson has always hated the band name, and yet managed to stick with it for 44 years. But in last years, and that's at least my impression, there was this cunning plan to shift away from the Jethro Tull name once and for all, and he just followed through with it. And this album here, TAAB2, is basically the Crossroad album making it possible. I like the cover design here because it follows the original Thick as a Brick look, but now, 40 years later, we are in the age of social media, so St. Cleve's Chronicle has obviously become a website, Gone are the days of newspapers, so there is a lot of nods and tongue-in-cheek references to the original album, yet at the same time this is an ironic look uh, at the modern times of consumer economy, social media, but also the fleeting nature of time and the fleeting nature of our lives if we allow ourselves to be distracted by nonsense. There are certainly no signs of fatigue in this album. Hashtag kudos Mr. Anderson. Number 20, 1974's War Child. A whimsical, certainly interesting album. As a project, it is a sketchy production, to be honest. There's some new stuff, some stuff from previous recording sessions. I've always liked Skating Away and I've always felt that 
it very strongly echoes Thick as a Brick because it has this Gerald Bostock attitude in the lyrics and style. Later I found out that this makes a lot of sense since it's an older recording from the Thick as a Brick days. Now, some music for this album was originally intended as a soundtrack to a movie project of sorts that never took off, maybe for the better. Honestly, I usually find movies made by musicians quite indigestible. For the band, this was a bit of a crossroads moment because prior to that... Um, excuse me. Because prior to that, Passion Play was a bit of a turkey. Unjustly, of course. But after a long string of big successes, that band had their first bummer. Kind of like Yes with Topographic Oceans. So War Child, at least on paper, marks a step towards a more radio-friendly format. But oddly enough, it is all smoke screens by Anderson. Because if you look closer, this is actually the start of a short period of the band marked by really extravagant and eccentric music with War Child, Minstrel and Too Old to Rock and Roll. So while abandoning the long song format to some degree, the band certainly didn't go full mainstream. Actually a lot of craziness and proper Jethro Tull weirdness lies exactly in those years. My favorite track here is probably Ladies and Backdoor Angels, which are both very complementary and almost work like one song. But also the title track War Child. Generally this album does get mixed reviews. I like it, but it certainly doesn't feel very cohesive and more like a collection of very inspired deep cuts. It is probably not the kind of album to start with if you are new to Jethro Tull, but I certainly would not dismiss it. It is an interesting product of its own time. Number 19, Homo Eraticus from 2014. So, Homo Eraticus is Ian Anderson's last studio project and this album was met with praise and strong interest, released with an evocative and idiosyncratic cover. This record is another large canvas concept album, this time dealing with the ideas of Britishness under a historical and cultural perspective, at least that's how uh, it appeared to me. It also marks the lyrical return of Little Milton, aka Gerald Bostock, for a third time. It is certainly a much heavier album than Thick as a Brick Part 2, offering also much more progressive rock. But at the same time, it retains a certain Elizabethan vibe reminiscent of the days of Minstrel at the Gallery. The lineup is basically identical with the lineup of TAAB2 with uh, Florian Opale on guitar, John O'Hara on keyboards, David Goodyear on bass and Scott Hammond on drums. And again, Ryan O'Donnell on additional vocals, singing some great duets and choruses with Anderson. Now, I'm not saying that every track blows me away. Many of them are just good tunes, but probably slightly unremarkable. But overall, this is a good album that somehow completely eradicates any distinguishing between Jethro Tull and Ian Anderson. <laughs> In parts, it sounds very much like Tull. As a highlight, I can recommend the opener Doggerland. That, that one is quite wonderful, but there is more. Check out a track called Puer Ferox Adventus. Yeah, there are a lot of Latin name tracks on this album. Check out the track Trupudium Ad Bellum. Great prog number with a Florian Opale being on fire. A very cinematic track that's actually very much in the spirit of the original Thick as a Brick, now that I think of it. Number 18 is 1993's Nightcap. So I said at the beginning I include here two records that are usually being treated as compilations, but they still count for me as genuine studio efforts based on the material in question. Nightcap was released in 1993, but it is a bit of a time capsule, revealing the year 1972 and 1973 when Tull failed to record a follow-up album to Thick as a Brick at the infamous Chateau d'Orville in France. And now there is also a second CD here with deep cuts from all over the place, let's not talk about that, because that's indeed the compilation part here. I want to focus only on disc one here, 
parts of the material had already been rearranged into what was to become a passion play a year later. So this original material disappeared somewhere in the drawer for a very long time. Actually, a large section of these recording sessions had already been unearthed in 1988 um, for the 20 years box set by Jethro Tull. Um, but now the material had been expanded, restructured and mastered even a little more. Um, the album starts with some shorter tracks that are more rounded up fragments or unfinished compositions. So some of the material suddenly fades out after two minutes for whatever reasons. You have to take that into account that this is a bit of a Jethro Tull archaeology. But the more the CD progresses, the more cohesive the material becomes. To some extent, the music is quite in the style of Passion Play and War Child. And if you like those albums, it is worth of your time and money to look into those productions. Also, you get a second disc with 18 deep cuts and rarities, many of them pretty cool. But as far as the so-called Chateau disaster tapes go, once you are through with the first six short tracks, stuff gets pretty serious. Just check out the incredible Left Right with its heavy riffs and experimental approach. This whole CD is an amazing discovery. Certainly my favorite track is Critique Oblique and Post Last, which is great prog rock mayhem of the highest order. Same goes for the final track, No Rehearsal. That's some really great stuff. I mean, sure, some of, some of it is a bit sketchy, but in many ways the whole thing is a bit of a rediscovered treasure. By the way, if you feel like a passion play is too short for you as a single disc album, and you crave a bit of the double album immersion, then this is the right CD for you. It makes total sense to combine passion play and the Chateau disaster tapes into something much bigger. Go for it, it works. Whew. I had to take a break doing some calisthenics and uh, working the resistant bands, <laughs> but now we can continue. Um, where are we? Uh, number 17, Rupees Dance from 2003. This album is named after one of Anderson's cats. Some amazing compositions here. Very versatile album, far from any cliches. In this particular decade, this is amongst best of Anderson's work. The album continues the whimsical and yet highly personal style of the secret language of birds, with this feeling of chamber music, yet with some strong excursions into progressive rock. Kaliandra Shade is a wonderful opener in this new style. Now, I don't find all of the tracks enormous or amazing, otherwise this album would probably rank higher, but there is a lot of good stuff here. My personal highlight here must be definitely Lost in Crowds, which is one of the best compositions written by Anderson in this period of time. But this album has a lot to offer. Check out the rather moody composition A Week of Moments, or the sarcastic Urology, or the observational Not Ralitsa Vasileva about uh, the Bulgarian journalist Ralitsa Vasileva, who had worked at CNN at the time and uh, was oftentimes seen by Anderson while lying on the bed of a hotel room after a concert and chilling. Number 16, Roots to Branches from 1995. I really welcomed Roots to Branches because after three albums that were rather blues rock records, this was a wonderful fresh air of prog rock. And I think this record was generally praised as a return to form at least in context of progressive rock. So there is a lot of complex stuff going on here and some great keyboard playing by Andrew Giddings, who appeared here as a full member of the band for the first time. Although he had already made some contributions uh, to Catfish Rising almost five years prior to that. The composition certainly reflects Anderson's passion for all things Indian. There are suddenly Middle Eastern influences in the music that spice up the progressive rock atmosphere of this album. Also Martin Barr's playing here is outstanding. Check out a track like Rare and Precious Chain, great guitar playing. The entire album flows really great and there is a wonderful proggy edge to all the songs. The sound feels very uncompromising and emphatic. Another great track is At Last Forever, or even the charming ballad Stuck in the August Rain. Number 15, Living in the Past from 1972. 
As I said, there are two compilations type of records in this ranking. This is after Nightcap, the second one. This compilation came out in 1972 and marks the end of an era and creates a kind of a closure regarding the rather checkered material of the early years. So only very few tracks here are just outtakes from previous albums. Instead you get a double album with mostly deep cuts and tracks that had only been released on 7-inch singles, b-sides, etc. So yeah, it's a mishmash of tracks of all kind, recorded in different years, but a lot of the music saw here for the first time the light of day as a stereo recording. So there was also some remastering done here. Certainly the three huge highlights here are Living in the Past, Sweet Dream and The Witch's Promise. But also some great yet less known tracks like Up the Pool or Dr. Bogenbroom. And check out the short track For Later, which is actually pure jazz fusion. So this is a great album. While quite chaotic, it's certainly an interesting expedition into the first four years of Jethro Tull's existence and it includes some very essential material which is why I treat it as an equal album here in this ranking. Moving on. Number 14 Stand Up from 1969 I fully understand the aura that surrounds this album. Stand Up is a record that oozes the feeling of musical freedom. It is very experimental and seems to explode in all directions between Middle Eastern inspired themes and jazzy Johann Sebastian Bach and psychedelic guitar solos. So this record has a lot to offer, but in many sense it also evokes a feeling of nostalgia, looking back to those times when life was good and a band like that represented dreams and bold musical ideas everything seemed possible. So this is without doubt a milestone record, one for the history books. While Stand Up still begins with a rather bluesy vibe, it becomes obvious that this album marks also a massive change in direction for a band that had basically just started and also a band that had just fired its main guitar player, who at this point was the only guy in the band that had some pedigree and some, some name in the local rock scene. So that's an interesting point in time. It's, it's great fun to listen to Glenn Cornick here playing his vibrant tripping bass style. There are some wonderful tunes on this record, particularly We Used to Know and the highly original and captivating Fat Man. But also the beautifully psychedelic Look Into the Sun with Martin Barr playing the hell out of his wah-wah pedal or the dynamic for a thousand mothers, which is another highlight for me. Number 13, jtal.com 1999. Okay, let's talk about jtal.com. Now this album gets put down a lot. I have watched other people's rankings and people seem to hate it and to dismiss it right away. Some respectable fellows even claim Anderson produced it only to promote the new URL to the Jethro Tull website. I disagree entirely. This is one of my favorite top productions of the late years. The lineup here is with Martin Barr on guitar, Jonathan Noyce on bass, Andrew Giddings on keyboards and Dwayne Perry on drums. I don't need to look far for highlights. The second track called Dot Com is one of the best numbers Anderson wrote in the late years. Wonderful track, I totally love this song. Excellent album overall. I also like the playful and original approach here with quirky tracks like Hot Mango Flush. People have issues with tracks like that, but I find them rather endearing. Another great track is AWOL and the heavy riff orgy Hunt by Numbers. But check out the evocative and proggy El Nino. That is probably the best guitar riff that Anderson wrote since the days of Stormwatch. Wonderful song. Probably my favorite on this album. So yeah, I proclaim this is a wonderful record, totally underrated. And listen to El Nino, Martin Barr is incredible here. Number 12, Minstrel at the Gallery from 1975. Minstrel is a great album. It's witty and fascinating. It has an incredible sound and while it is in some parts rather tongue in cheek, it has its share of melancholy. Certainly the one Jethro Tull record that is being associated with the adjective Elizabethan most. 
The title track Minstrel at the Gallery is an incredible opener with a complex riff-oriented prog rock that has become quite iconic, almost like a calling card of Jethro Tull. The second track, Cold Wind to Valhalla, is a brilliant song exploring Nordic ideas, a realm of themes Ian Anderson would revisit again and again in the following years. Black Satin Dancer is a wonderful, joyful song, despite the overused blues cliche in the middle, but it is a good song with some staggering singing by Anderson and one of the greatest guitar solos by Martin Barr. Actually, a parallel double solo, the central piece of this album is obviously the 17 minutes long Baker Street Muse that for me kind of feels like the aftermath to a passion play. It is a great song and I always like to revisit this large canvas. I love how the song begins with a failed intro that is so typical Tal breaking down the, the fourth wall. And Baker Street Muse has some wonderful contributions by Barrymore Barlow. Wonderful vibe overall. Minstrel at the Gallery is a wonderful record with some beautiful orchestral additions by David Palmer, which give the music a somewhat dreamy and almost romantic demeanor. Number 11, A Passion Play from 1973. Yeah, so this is probably controversial to some because it is my impression that this album ends up a lot in the top regions of rankings. Some even call it their definite number one. And I get it, I don't find that odd at all. This record is a fascinating journey. As if one record with only one track on it was not enough, with a Thick as a Brick. Tull had to do it again and deliver another one-track album. Ironically, Thick as a Brick was always very much commented by Anderson as a satirical reaction to prog rock bands and their album epicness. And I get it, when you listen to Thick as a Brick you kind of hear the the tongue-in-a-cheek moments when they mock bands like uh, Yes or Soft Machine and Gentle Giant a little. But how interesting that a passion play is suddenly a very proggy statement without the approach of a parody. Sure, sure, there is still a bit of the jazzy Monty Python type of humor happening with all its theatricality, but suddenly it is mostly all very serious. Now I love this album, but I guess the reason why it doesn't rank stellar high in my list has to do with the melodies and themes that I don't find as appealing compared with the albums that will follow next. Which is not much of a critique, honestly. I think A Passion Play is a great masterpiece and an important, very fascinating album. It has a lot of interesting, surprising moments that sound really exciting and raise your eyebrows. One of those albums where you can sink your teeth in and study it. This is a great musical expedition, so I don't have anything bad to say about it. I just like some tall albums more. Number 10. A from 1980. I love A. What a fascinating record. Stylistically almost like it was designed for me and my taste. First, I love Mark Crane's drumming here. It's not the melodic, inventive style of Barry Barlow, but combined with the amazing bass playing by Peggy, in some moments it creates this feeling of jazz funk and even kind of disco. I love it. This was the first record with David Pegg, who is an incredible bass player. Now I find the A side of this album basically flawless. There are four tracks here that are all incredible. The only reason why this record is not in my top three is because the B side does have some tracks I don't enjoy that much. But damn, this album has stuff to offer. It is the one with the Mercurial Eddie Jobson, former keyboard player of Curved Air and UK, playing her keys and electric violin. And wow, this is certainly the contender for the most hilarious keyboard playing on any Jethro Tull albums. I love the lyrical themes of this record, which feel very contemporary and reflect upon pop culture, science, mass media, UFOs and labor politics. It's a well-known fact that in the band's history, this is a bit of a tainted album, marking a massive change in lineup and a lot of interpersonal disappointment and sadness by the fired members of the band. 
The record was not intended to be a Jethro Tell album, but Ian Anderson's first solo album. The A stands here for Anderson. While Chrysalis talked him into making it a Tal record, for obvious reasons, he always regretted that. So suddenly there was this Tal album with all these musicians on board that people never heard about. It certainly solidified Anderson's image of being a ruthless Aaron boss. Now there are usually two sides to stories like that, but that's not the place here in this video to analyze that. My favorites on this album take anything from the A side, outstanding stuff, but on the B side check out the wonderful closing track and further on. Number 9 is the 1983's Walk Into Light. Incredible album, underrated, even despised by some. Finally Anderson got his first solo record after A was turned into a Tal album. This entire record is basically a collaboration between Anderson and Peter John Vatassi from Scotland, who was this nerdy looking keyboard wizard that started playing with Jethro Tull a year before that. So this is more or less a 80s synthesizer album, but it has this attitude of a singer-songwriter record, just not with acoustic guitars or a piano, but with this electronic aesthetic of the 80s. I find that incredible. I love to immerse myself into this beautiful statement of a record. This is one of Anderson's best work lyrically, a firework of observational poetry, political, social, philosophical. I also love the cover, this change of image. Suddenly Anderson looks like a union leader. He has this Jeremy Corbyn vibe in the photograph, which is a bit hilarious. Wonderful album. And I know about all the hate it still gets and I do not care. I think it is a masterpiece and a wonderful collection of songs that beautifully balance between their intimate personal meaning and their universal message. My favorites, where to start? Made in England maybe, Trains, Walk into Light, Black and White Television, the fascinating user-friendly or the allergic, slightly disturbing, different Germany. Number 8, Songs from the Wood from 1977. This album marks the start of the famous folk rock trilogy, dealing with English nature and forest life, with English mythology and the atmosphere of campfires. And bloody hell, what an incredible album it is! The band here moved officially into a six-people lineup, with David Palmer becoming the official member of the band, with Palmer and Evan behind keyboards. Barry Moore on drums and John Glasscock on bass, and they sound incredibly tight. I mean, just listen to the complexity of Hunting Girl. This is a wonderful prog rock orgy with hilariously provocative lyrics. Though it's mostly folky elements in the sound, there are some interesting connections to rather historical music of the Renaissance. I guess that's another moment to evoke the term Elizabethan, particularly in a track like Velvet Green, which is such an excellent composition. My other favorite tracks are the title track for sure and Hunting Girl, of course. The Whistler is also another excellent number. Number 7. Benefit from 1970. I guess I am one of those guys who put Benefit above stand-up. But I love the serious emotional core to this record. There is also the silhouette of Ian Anderson slowly becoming one of the greatest lyricists in rock history. It may not be entirely obvious here, but this is the beginning. Also, I love the guitar work by Lancelot here. This is the one record where he has this beautiful psychedelic sound. Anderson's flute is also outstanding. And it is the last time we hear Glenn Cornick with Jethro Tau. My favorite tracks here, certainly the magical opener with you there to help me, a song that so beautifully evolves into this psychedelic extravaganza. But again, the second track, Nothing to Say, is also wonderful. I find the melodies here superb and Anderson's voice is on top of his game. I find even the color of his voice here is iconic. When you think of Jethro Tull, this is how it sounds in your mind. For me, Benefit is such a game changer, brilliant album. This LP already has John Evan on piano, albeit as a guest performer, 
before becoming full members soon after, but listen to the tasteful piano playing on the third track called Alive and Well and Living In, actually one of my favorite piano parts ever, wonderfully played by John Evan, very transatlantic and laid back and I love it. And then the intense driving sun and so on. A great record with a magical atmosphere, a true masterpiece. Number six, Stormwatch from 1979. Stormwatch is a problematic album for some. It was not very popular back in the day, but in the last four decades, the stock in this record certainly went up. It is the third of the so-called folk prog trilogy dealing with a different aspect of country life, the maritime world of fishermen, and the commercialization of the Atlantic and generally the life on the coast lashed with wind, rain and bad weather. So this is a very atmospheric album and musically speaking probably Jethro Tull's hardest or heaviest record. Obviously it is overshadowed by the untimely passing of the great John Glasscock, who died of heart failure at the age of 28. He still plays on Flying Dutchman, Orion and Elegy, but the other bass parts were recorded by Anderson himself. A lot has been said about John Glasscock and how Ian Anderson was around him. Accusations have been uttered, but there are again different sides of the story. He was the most important bass player the band had, I think, despite having only such a short time with Jethro Tull. This record has some of my favorite Tal tracks, the opener North Sea Oil, exploring the politics of oil drilling in the North Atlantic. Then there is Orion, this wonderful music about average people's life in London, with all of its banal sadness and beauty. Home is probably the most beautiful love song ever written by Anderson, simple and yet so glorious. Something's on the Move is a wonderful heavy rock song, completely underrated and criminally overlooked. Dan Ringil is another exploration of Nordic or Celtic themes. This album has a lot to offer, despite its slightly sketchy production and the fact that this lineup was genuinely battered at this point in time. Number 5. Aqualunk from 1971. While a lot has been said about this album, I'm sure that of all the Tal records it is the most explored by YouTubers, so I probably don't need to say that much about it. I guess it is what you would call a seminal album, it has a bit of a concept album touch, despite Anderson denying any prog rock concept behind it, but it certainly feels that way. The A side is more about how people live and the B-side is about what people believe. But I acknowledge that this is not that much of a concept. Aqualong is the first album recorded with Jeffrey Hammond, who really gives everything here to keep up with the guys. This is certainly one of my favorite Tal albums regarding Martin Barr's guitar sound and playing overall. There is something about his fuzzy, raw guitar playing that is just deeply captivating and unique. And his famous solo on Aqualong is obviously one for the history books. Now I'll be honest with you, I don't listen to Aqualung anymore. I have done this more than enough when I was 14 or 15. And I have done it enough when I was 25 or 26. But there is a moment where you need to put an album like this away. Um, because uh, repetition won't just do it for you anymore. So after so many years I actually gave it a listen just for this video, trying to keep my brain alert while doing so, just to confirm what a great contribution this album is. Particularly the keyboards and the electric guitar in Cross-Eyed Mary, so amazing. You immediately feel in the presence of musical giants. But this album is not shy with amazing tracks. Up to me is gigantic, just listen to Martin Barks playing there, holy cow. Wind Up is excellent and what about Mother Goose? But I also like these little vignettes here, particularly Cheap Day Return that obviously reflects upon Ian Anderson visiting his father in the hospital. For me this also marks the beginning of the, of the really outstanding lyrics by Anderson. I always preferred his observational lyrics of the late 70s and of the 80s to the rather metaphysical musings like My God or Hymn 43 that are still rather dominant on this album. This is also the last album with Clive Bunker on drums, 
who was, by the way, not fired, but rather amicably left to marry the daughter of their American tour manager. So that's one of the few lineup changes that doesn't make Ian Anderson look like a tyrant. Now, this entire album was a rather difficult birth with a lot of artistic setbacks. But listening to the results, I say it was worth the sweat. A great record. Number four. Thick as a Brick, 1972. The fifth studio album is also the first one to include Barrymore Barlow. A lot has been said about Thick as a Brick and back in the day when this album was released it was probably the one record with the most intricate LP cover comprised of a large fake newspaper called St. Cleve's Chronicle. Anderson has always emphasized the satirical nature of this whole project. But that is not something I knew as a kid. I read about it years, if not decades, later in some interviews. The highly surreal and grotesque articles inside the cover sleeve were a bit of a giveaway, I'd say. But I remember growing up in the 80s, surrounded by much older first-generation Tull fans, and none of them seemed to have any kind of awareness of the fact that Thick as a Brick is a spoof of Camel, Yes, ELP or Gentle Giant. The album is highly functional, and if you take it all very seriously, it rather works as this existentialistic meditation about the human condition, about the fleeting nature of youth, and about the burdens of patriarchy. It's kind of all there. So it's not difficult to walk into the trap of taking Thick as a Brick very seriously. It's all very pittoresque, and the nature of the statements made here actually reminds me a lot of La Citadelle by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry which is basically a collection of fragments of a future book by Saint-Exupéry that was never released and uh, that uh, has kind of a similar vibe and a similar feeling and a similar odd masculinity in its statements. Musically this is a great and unique achievement, particularly the A-side is incredibly well constructed and a thematic masterpiece, it's actually quite breathtaking. The B-side is a bit more sketchy in my book, but then again, if you see it as what it is, a rather humorous reenactment of a slightly pretentious prog rock production, then all the weird disjointed parts on the B-side suddenly make sense. But simply as a prog rock album, this record works beautifully, featuring some great riffing and soloing by Martin Barr, and extremely creative drumming by Barrymore Barlow. If I ever needed an extra reason to regard Barry as one of my favorite drummers, this album would be it. Now, as far as the whole spiel with the alter ego, the little Milton, goes, I actually think that Gerald Bostock works better on Thick as a Brick Part 2 and Homo Eraticus, simply because back in the day I never really bought into the idea that these lyrics, plastered with human experience and an emotional cynicism that you can only acquire over years of time could have been written by a fictional eight-year-old boy. I like the idea of a child genius, a poetic prodigy, but even a child genius can only write poetry about things reflected from the eight years of his existence. And there is a lot going on in these lyrics that just doesn't lend itself to the, to the observations of an eight-year-old albeit a genius one. You see, it's happening again, I'm taking Thick as a Brick far too seriously. That's the one thing with this album. Number three. The Broadsword and the Beast from 1982. Hard to imagine that this album was not hundred times more successful. By now it is quite revered, but it was a big success in Germany back in the day, actually doubling the entire sales numbers of the band. And Germany was always Tal's second biggest market after USA. This record is a fascinating journey of microscopic and macroscopic ideas between the intimate and the global. Particularly on the A-side, every track is spot on. Beastie kidnaps you into the mindset of psychosis and psychotherapy, while Clasp is an amazing reflection of modern big city life, while Fallen on Hard Times questions the honesty of the usual political process and asks if you should hold politicians more accountable. With flying colors you suddenly find yourself in the middle of a marriage conflict. All these songs have a very precise message and incredible lyrics. 
Those are some of the best texts Anderson ever wrote. It's outstanding. The role of Peter John Battessi in this jewel of an album is immense. He infused this huge portion of fresh blood into the mix and boy did it work. This is probably one of the greatest prog band rejuvenations next to 90125 by Yes. My only gripe was with the CD, which was around since the early 80s before the album was remastered. I had the CD like three times over the course of time and this was not a good mix down. The sound was shallow and lacked edge and the volume was horrendously low. The vinyl record actually sounded much better, so if you're getting this one on CD, avoid the old pressings. Get rather one of the remastered one with eight additional tracks that didn't get on the album back in the day because of space. Although this would have been a really cheeky double album, some of these extra tracks are actually so good that I could easily imagine some of them replacing some material on the B-side. Particularly Seal Driver, which I'm not too fond of, although it is still a good song. Anyway, this is a wonderful, colorful album that is just exciting because of this encounter of relevant topics and a sophisticated, extremely charming musicianship. People never talk about a track like Flying Colors, but from time to time this was my favorite Tull track of all times. There's just something about it. It is a snapshot of real life, of the intrinsic tragedy of every marriage, and yet there is also hope. And I could do this to every track of this album. It's just too wonderful. Not to mention that this is one of the coolest and most evocative covers of the entire rock history. Believe me, this t-shirt sold really well in Germany. Now the last two albums. I had the really a hard time to decide which should be two and which should be one. And honestly, I could have placed them the other way around, so it's maybe a bit interchangeable. Number two, Heavy Horses, 1978. Yeah, this seems to be my favorite one from the Folk Trilogy. While Songs from the Wood was focused on forestry, Heavy Horses shines a light on a very different aspect of country life, the world of agriculture and farm life. And I love how this is a concept album with a concept that is so unobtrusive. That's how I like it. I find this record through and through outstanding. Just the opener and the mouse police never sleeps is the most incredible thing you can imagine. And just to be followed by Acres Wild, which is this amazing upbeat mandolin anthem, clearly showing Jethro Tull's close ties to Fairport Convention at this point in time. This album is track by track just an incredible experience, perfectly balancing progressive rock, complexity with a groovy, almost dance-oriented attitude. It is filled with impressions of life, what the Germans call Lebensgefühl. And yeah, this is the one album where John Glasgow gets a chance to shine in a big way. Just listen to Journeyman and this marvelous bass driving the song. And at this point, that is something new in this band, because before, bass players almost never drove the music in Tull. The guitars and the vocals did, the drums for sure, but Anderson was always very practical about the bass sound fulfilling its acoustic function, but hardly ever more. But here, the bass is just raging, giving the band an entirely new identity. Great playing by John Glasgow, who was an incredibly good bassman. If you want to get deeper into his playing, check out his work with the band Carmen. Awful story that a year later John would be dead only at the age of 28. But here, in 1978, you can celebrate his outstanding musicianship. What an album! I think if you apply the quality standards of progressive rock and jazz fusion, this is probably the moment in time when Jethro Tull plays best. It's immaculate. Everybody's on top of their game. Barrymore Barlow's drumming is amazing here. Inventive, melodic, captivating drumming. Just listen what he contributes to a track like Rover. Not to mention the wonderful Weathercock. Martin Barr is so poised and so superior on this album. Great guitar playing. Anderson's voice is sublime. His storytelling totally intriguing. And the existential sadness of the song Heavy Horses is truly heartbreaking. Now I've seen Jethro Tull live many times, but I would have loved to see the band live in this phase, as captured by the following live album bursting out with this lineup. Now Jethro Tull is obviously not the type of band that would drive you to tears with their music. 
but if they ever got close to it, it might be on this album. Heavy Horses is a monument of beauty, a perfect moment in time, a perfect lineup. And finally, number one, Under Raps, 1984. So, where to start? Obviously, I need to explain myself. So there is this album that ranks in all TAL rankings almost exclusively at the very last spot, at the bottom of the barrel. And a whole bunch of diehard TAL fans will even persist that this is not a real TAL album and should probably be burned in some public way. A few years back I had occasionally left Jethro Tal oriented forums and online communities because I've grown tired listening to this endless tirades by unhappy people telling me how this album is a crime against humanity. Obviously the fact that this album was not a big success and was aggressively panned by critics hardly helped the matter. So the thought could come up that me placing this album at number one of my ranking is just some vindictive overreaction. Maybe I'm hoping that some of the underwrap hating Tal fans finally pop a brain aneurysm and die. But no, that's not my motivation at all. My passion for this album is genuine and I know something that you probably don't. I know that if this society, this civilization does not destroy itself within the next 20 years, which is too close to call at this point, this album will finally rise and be acknowledged for what it is. I have seen this happen. I grew up in a time when people collectively hated drama by Yes and the James Bond movie in Her Majesty's Secret Service with George Lazenby. Now show me today some people on YouTube that rip those two apart. The contrary is the case now. They are actually being revered. I just need to set this one out. No pun intended. When all the Tal fans of the first and second generation have died out, things will change. But seriously. I love the unique attitude of this album. People say, oh, it's Tal doing Ultravox and Depeche Mode. Utter drivel. What makes this album really incredible is that it is, to some extent, a unique thing of its own. The most incredible blind alley of it all. It's some sort of techno rock, but no one ever created anything similar. Yes, it's fully electronic, but let's not forget that it came out in 1984, only a few months before The Age of Consent by Bransky Beat, an album I would regard as the ultimate synthpop statement of its era. But under rap sound nothing like Bransky Beat or Duran Duran or Depeche Mode or Yazoo. It is very much its own thing. Actually, only the the Walk Into Light solo album that Anderson released a year before that kind of bookends this whole experience. I know Peggy was not keen on playing on it, but that's also kind of funny, because Jethro Tull invited him into the band when they were still a pure folk rock act, which made sense since Peg was the basement of Fairport Convention, and suddenly you wake up and you are part of this hyper-futuristic computer-based group. <laughs> I find it hilarious. And I love every track on this record. I like the lyrical side of it, mostly surrounding themes of the European Union, the yuppie culture and the political climate of the late Cold War. This album is super fascinating, it has a very subversive humor, and it even takes you into space. There is something certifiably insane about the entire production, probably because this is a bunch of seasoned folk rock musicians that suddenly take their orders from a young kid from Scotland that looks like a pre-Microsoft Bill Gates. It is completely outlandish. But you know what? It's now 36 years and I still like to listen to this album. So that tells you something. It really ages gracefully and those who discover it, and there are some, are surprised by its eccentric sound. It's like having a secret hatch somewhere in your basement. And if you climb through this hatch, you find yourself in 1984, where you can run through the streets of London for a while. You'll have to go back eventually, but this one time travel is always available for you. So yes, let me tell you this from the deepest of my heart. After 36 years of people wagging the finger in my face and telling me to adjust my medications, here is my response. 
This is the best Tal album ever recorded. And maybe that is something you will never understand because your horizon just doesn't reach far enough. And if this gets yourself in a tizzy, well, that's on you. So, see you next time. I wonder what other band I should rank. Can somebody call an ambulance? <laughs>